Your trench is on the southern edge of modern-day Albania. It's been inhabited since prehistoric times and has been the site of a Greek colony, a Roman city, and a bishopric. Following a period of prosperity under Byzantine administration and then a brief occupation by the Venetians, the city was abandoned in the late Middle Ages after marshes formed in the area. The present archaeological site is a repository of ruins representing each period of the city's development. Because of this, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and theoretically protected, although the Albanians are limited in what they can do to secure the site. Some of the problem is millenniums long decay and neglect. Some is modern neglect. The biggest problem, however, is water. The tiny peninsula in which Butrint sits is currently between 1 and 2 meters above sea level. Previous earthquakes, most notably the one in 360 AD, caused significant subsidence of the ground. This might be a clue that the, that the next big earthquake will do the same thing. Complicating this is the fact that seawater levels are rising. The time may come when this fascinating park will be completely submerged in water. Let's take a look at this fascinating area before it disappears forever, today on the Armchair Traveler. Welcome to my channel. If you think this content is interesting or useful, please like, share, and subscribe. This will help the channel grow. Travel content often involves a lot of history, and history can be really word heavy, heavy enough that the details often don't make it into a video blog. If you care to dig deeper, you can visit my regular blog on WordPress, where you'll find deep dives, travel tips, reviews, warnings, and the nuts and bolts on how to travel safely and conveniently. If you'd like to keep up with my posts, you can follow me on Twitter. The addresses are on your screen and in the description box below. This is a view of the beach at Saranda, Bulgaria. I'm not a beach person, so it really had no appeal to me, so I opted for a day trip to Butrint, an archaeological park about 35 miles from here. I had never heard of it, nor had anybody on my tour, as far as I could tell. It's a World Heritage Site, which makes it a natural Judy magnet. The guide tried to tell me that Saranda gets all kinds of cruise ships, and I have no doubt that they are trying. We were the only cruise ship in port when I visited. Of all the people I've chatted with on the tour afterwards, not one had ever heard of Saranda, much less Butrint. I am convinced, at least for now, in my assessment that this was a cruise tryout port. From time to time, cruise ship companies try to expand their itineraries and give otherwise ignored ports a tryout. At snack time, I talked to an elderly English couple who partially confirmed what I had guessed. Turkey had been on the itinerary for this tour when they pre-booked it a year earlier, and some months before the cruise, clearly before I had booked, they had gotten, gotten a letter from Holland America telling her that Kusadesi was out and Saranda was in. I have to admit, it wasn't my first choice of ports. In talking with the guide, I learned a little bit about the city. It's pretty small, and aside from the beaches and facilities catering to beach visitors, there seem to be a lot of bars, there's very little here to draw a visitor's attention. To be fair, however, the country and the city are still clearly developing. Walk a block or two back from the beach and you'll be confronted with not just very aggressive beggars, but the hulks of unfinished residential construction. As I mentioned, you only have to walk a few streets away from the promenade to find the legacy of Enver Hoxha's 40 years of his own brand of communist control, coupled with ongoing construction fraud. The buildings right on the beach are in pristine condition and doubtless command top prices for the owners from various tourists. But a couple of blocks up the hill, you'll not only have to evade beggars, some of them very aggressive, but walk around, over, and through mountains of construction debris framing unfinished concrete block buildings. The good news here is that I did see plenty of rebar, reinforcing bars put into the concrete to stiffen and reinforce the walls in this, a serious seismic zone. This is an aerial view of the site. A huge amount of work has gone into clearing this site, which has suffered a great deal of damage from neglect, abandonment, groundwater, invasions, earthquakes, and a lot of vegetation. Excavations and identification of the various sites, along with making it relatively safe for visitors, was well underway when I arrived in 2019. Unfortunately, not very long after that, the pandemic closed in, and somehow I doubt they've made much progress in the nearly four years since that time. 
The aerial view gives you some idea of the extent of the map remains. The theater, that arched object you can see in the center, was built by Roman residents, probably on top of an older Greek theater. The center area of it, which should have been where people stood and called the orchestra, is actually normally filled with water. Based on its physical proximity to what is now part of Greece, you'd be correct if you guessed that this was a Greek outpost or that there was a polis here. Polis is a Greek word meaning city. In ancient Greece, it originally referred to an administrative and religious city center, as distinct from the rest of the city. Later on, however, it evolved and was recycled into a Roman colonia. A colonia was originally a Roman outpost established in conquered territory to secure it. In 48 BC, Caesar arrived here in the midst of a civil war against Pompey the Great. Pompey had a naval base across the straits at the time. Stationing one legion here in the city, Caesar used it as a supply base and a bulwark against Pompey's fleet. After his victory, Caesar initiated a plan to colonize the city. The idea was that retired soldiers would settle there, marry, take root, and build cities. The Agora, Pitanian Stoa, and the Temple of Asclepios that you see here were all elements of the Greek site. Later, when the Romans arrived, they appropriated much of what had already built and either recycled the buildings or renamed them. An agora was simply a meeting place that in Roman times evolved into a forum, although the forum is a little bit distant from the old agora. A stoa was a covered walkway, likely, likely lined with shops and a place where the citizens could meet and greet, and show off their fancy clothes, I suppose, as well as to shop and conduct public business. We still see them today in the form of colonnades or covered walkways outside our shopping malls. The Pritanium housed a hearth of Hestia and its eternal fire symbolizing the well-being of the state. That sounds rather like the Roman temple to the Vestal Virgins to me. Asclepios was an important Greek god whose attributes and names were appropriated wholesale by the later Romans. His temple was an important part of the Greek community, and distinguished foreign visitors were sometimes invited. This view shows you the remains of the Greek agora, which eventually was converted into a Roman forum. It was the center of Greek city life. Notice that the foundations are stone. That's what makes people think that this was probably a Greek building initially. But the buildings above the ground line are actually Roman brick. The theater of Boutrint dates back to the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. Every decent Greek or Roman city would have had one of these. It was an indispensable part of urban architecture. Although many of them are no longer recognizable, two millennia of rain, pollution, mining for stone, earthquakes, and general destruction will do that. This one survived in remarkable condition. The photograph shows the orchestra as well as part of the stage, each of which is covered with large pieces of plywood. They did that because the area underneath the plywood had about a foot of groundwater. The bridge in the photo in the right isn't over a moat. The entire site has subsided some, and the water under that bridge has turtles, so I suspect the water is a permanent feature. Location is destiny. Boutrint sits alongside what has always been a major trading route and has fallen prey to every trading nation that came along. Greek, Roman, Christian, Byzantine, Ottoman, Turks. The first image in this video blog showed that the site is literally dwarfed by a large saltwater lake. Here you see the so-called Lake Gate, which sits in one of the city walls. From here, visitors in the Greek period could ascend to the Acropolis. The story goes that Aeneas sailed through here when he was bugging out of Troy and before he made it to Italy. He was said to have recognized this and said it looked like the gate in Troy. Boutrint had fallen under Roman rule in 228 BC, long before these two men came onto the scene, but it really wasn't extensively Romanized until after Rome ceased to be a republic and became an empire. These two each played a role in that Romanization. In 228, Boutrothum became a protectorate of Rome alongside Corfu. In the middle of the 2nd century BC, it was an independent state. In the next century, it became a part of the province of Macedonia. In 44 BC, Caesar designated Boutrothum, as they called it, as a colony to reward soldiers who had fought against him against Pompey. Julius Caesar, shown here on the left, had expanded the Roman Empire north and west to what is now Britain. Pompey the Great fought in Africa and Spain, 
quelled the slave revolt of Spartacus, cleared the Mediterranean of pirates, and conquered Armenia, Syria, and Palestine to the east. Each one of them wanted to be king of the world, and only one could succeed. The Roman civil wars are beyond what I feel competent tackling in a video blog, so I'll give you the 411 on it. Caesar boiled down from the north. Pompey was in Rome and had been designated by the Senate to lead the defense, but as Caesar advanced, Pompey split via the port of Brindisi, sailed south and east, and set up shop and left his navy and men on Corfu. Caesar matched this, apparently, with a legion on the other side of the straits, near what is now Boutrint. In the end, and it took a while, Caesar won. One of the things he did was to establish Butrint as a Roman colony, which is how the Roman building, rebuilding, and extension of the site, including extensive terraforming, began. The Roman Forum was planted on top of the former Greek Agora, which was already located in a nice flat area. There was a problem, however. In 360 AD, there was a huge earthquake, and the Forum floor basically split in half. Part of the Forum is now nearly three feet below the level of the rest of it. The Forum was where Roman citizens were able to meet and greet, shop, and chat, and transact public business. The public baths were reasonably close by. In the photograph on the left, you can see part of the recently discovered mosaic tile floor in the Forum. It is a remarkable discovery since that, along with the pre-cut stone, would have been prime building material that the people would have scavenged if not just plain stolen over time. On the right, you see some of the walls of what would have been smaller shops, probably including food shops and the local equivalent of bars that surround the Forum. Hardly any domestic buildings during either the days of the Roman Republic or the Roman Empire had any kind of indoor plumbing, so public baths were an important sanitary and social feature of all Roman and Romanized settlements. The Romans apparently got the idea, as they had so many others from the Greeks, but here they raised it to a new level. The Romans did not believe in understatement in their building projects. These were far more than just places to get clean, although that was their initial and primary purpose. They were meeting places, generally with separate accommodations for men and women. Business might also have been transacted here in different places, which might have included hot rooms, the heat was supplied by piping that ran under the floors, warm rooms, cold rooms with plunge pools, dressing rooms, and more. Some even had libraries, what I think of as public art. Mosaics, wall paintings, and probably more were required features for a civilized experience. Public baths weren't just ornate and efficient. They were sanitary. Roman public baths had a sanitation system with the water piped in and out. Baths were set up all over the empire for both military and civilian use. The initial idea was that cleanliness was necessary to maintaining a healthy military. Soldiers were used to them and clearly expected this feature, probably dolled up considerably, with under-the-floor heating when they became civilians. Here you can actually see parts of the raised floor. The openings you see were probably hypocausts through which hot air was forced to warm the bathing areas for the user's comfort and pleasure. The gyms, like all public buildings, including the baths, were often highly decorated. You can see the remains of a mosaic that would have been either above a door or a niche here on the left. On the right, you can see part of the remains of the wall of a Roman gymnasium. Sometimes the gyms included their own baths, which I believe is what the area now filled with still water must have represented. During my visit, however, it was not identified. This is called the Nifanium. It's a fountain from the late Roman period. The fountain was said by a Roman aqueduct that passed near here along the line of the ancient city wall. Fountains were an important feature in Roman settlements. There was no indoor plumbing, so this is how people got fresh water. The lion gate shown here is named after a large relief showing a lion attacking a bull. It was placed here sometime in the 6th century AD. The lion gate actually led to the lake and is built into the city walls. The lion relief was originally from a temple, possibly from the Acropolis. Putting in that huge stone lintel sharply reduced the size of the gateway, which is much shorter than the lake gate. Opinions vary about the origin and nature of the well of Junia Rufina. The story I was told during my visit was that she was a wealthy Roman citizen, and that part appears to have been correct, whose home was very near here. I rather have doubts about that second part, although I suppose anything is possible. But would a wealthy Roman really pitch up a house next to the city gate? 
I dug into this because I have an insatiable curiosity bump that demands scratching. Another story is that this was the focus of an early cult, this time to nymphs, although which ones exactly have never been specified that I can find out. In the Roman period, it was rebuilt and dedicated to the nymphs by Junia Rufina. A dedication is actually recorded in some carvings on the top of the well. After the Roman Empire was split, the Byzantines turned Butrint into an important Christian center. The baptistry that survives to this day was a Roman structure that was repurposed later on. It features an amazing mosaic floor displaying animals and an amazing geometric pattern, most of which now is sadly covered in a protective layer of sand and only uncovered a few days during the year. After the Roman Empire was split, the Byzantines turned Butrint into an important Christian center. The baptistry that survives to this day was a Roman structure that was repurposed later on. It features an amazing mosaic floor displaying animals and an amazing geometric pattern, most of which now is sadly covered in a protective layer of sand and only uncovered a few days during the year. Not far from the baptistry is the basilica. It's made entirely of stone except for the supports for the arches, not brick, and it has a nave with two rows of arches. Part of the original floor survives, and to me, it is still recognizable as a church. Eventually, after Rome fell, others came along to fill the vacuum and take their place. Venice rose as a trading and military powerhouse. By that time, however, a devastating earthquake had tumbled down all of the existing infrastructure here in Butrint. The Venetians, as a benefit of purchasing Corfu, acquired Butrint. However, in the 15th century, Butrint was, repeated, was repeatedly assaulted by the Ottomans, who really wanted Corfu, which would have given them a chokehold on sailing in this part of the sea. So ownership passed back and forth. The fortress is called the Triangular Castle, not because of the tower you see here, but the shape of the castle grounds. It was actually built to defend fish traps for the city, many of which were the primary financial asset of the settlement during the Venetian period. Soon afterward, the old town was, was abandoned in favor of the castle. The green area you see here is most likely reclaimed land being used for farming. The Venetian tower you see here was adjacent to the early Roman bath, which we've already seen. The tower has two cannon ports built into the walls on the sides that overlook the channel and sports musket ports, which are visible in my photo. An entrance to the tower is on the side and was originally protected by a drawbridge. The tower is built on dry ground and is not affected by the fluctuating groundwater levels in the area. These are the remains of the Triconch Palace. The first phase of the complex probably dates to the late 4th century AD, although whether before or after the earthquake, I do not know. It was added to in the 5th century as well. In 360 AD, a major earthquake had toppled much of Roman Butrint, and it caused the level of the area to drop close to 3 feet. This was already a low-lying area. The palace was built over the garden area of an earlier palace and over at least four earlier buildings, parts of which were incorporated into it. By the 6th century AD, the palace was afflicted by rising water levels, although new rooms were being added. However, the rising groundwater levels were such a problem that the building was abandoned. Despite the intense efforts of the people here to preserve the archaeological park is the problem of too much water. This is a partially uncovered foundation which was the base of a Hellenistic and Republican Roman villa on the lake. Although we didn't visit it, it must have once been prime building space. Today, today most of it is under three feet of water. Much of the archaeological remains here in Butrint are only between two and a half and six feet above sea level. Even during my visit, during what should have been dry season, you had to navigate over ponds and marshes, and there were mosquitoes to match. There's a little bit of territory up by the Acropolis, to which my tour did not extend, which is higher up, but most of the Roman buildings are clustered together. During the earthquake in 360, part of the floor of the Roman Forum split in half and dropped nearly three feet. Hydrologists think that eventually, no one knows when, but I suspect all it will take is a series of really wet years and another earthquake, the lake will revert to being fully part of the Ionian Sea. 
At present, the local people make a living here from tourism and farming oysters. Will that still even be possible? Will higher groundwater levels make it impossible for visitors, even with the raised duckboard sidewalks already on site? Will the only road in and out wash away? Only time will tell, and there are things that can be done to preserve what remains, and bigger things that could be done to slow down the real problem, which is rising sea level. But these actions are expensive, and the future is, well, it's in the future. In the meantime, Albania is not a rich country. The Albanian government and private contributors are making efforts to salvage, restore, and protect the Trent, not just for its archaeological and cultural significance, but also, to be honest, for its economic significance. Properly restored and better labeled, lack of labeling was a consistent problem throughout the site, and this place could become a real tourist powerhouse. Thank you for walking with me in Butrent today. Come back next week for another walking tour here on the Armchair Tour.